finance at the 2022 Honorable James R. Brown Symposium, Montana's Constitution, the next 50 years. My name is Eric Schmidt, and I'm one of the co-editors in chief of the Montana It's my pleasure to introduce the second panel of this event, The Shape of Montana's Constitution, Structure, Interpretation, and Federal Law Standing. It is also my honor to be able to introduce the moderator for today's panel, the Honorable Lori McKinnon. In addition to serving as a justice on the Montana Supreme Court, Justice McKinnon serves on the Executive Committee of the Appellate Judges Conference of the American Bar Association, serves on the Executive Committee, oh, I'm sorry, serves on the Appellate Judges Education Institute, served as an ABA advisor to the Uniform Law Commission's Fine and Fees Committee, and is a recipient of the Montana State Bar's Carla M. Gray Equal Justice Award. So please join me in welcoming our moderator for our second panel, the Honorable Lloyd McKinnon. Chairman Wade Hood, Vice Chair J. 
Kevin Laylock, members George James, Lyle Monroe, Rachel Mansfield, Veronica Simon, Marshall Murray, Bob Hansen, Bob Campbell, Donald Foster, and Dorothy Eck. In addition to his work at Montana's 1972 Constitutional Convention, Mr. Act, Mr. Applegate had worked in Congress with U.S. Representative Don Walker in Washington, Senator John Durkin from New Hampshire, and our own Senator Max Baucus. Mr. Applegate was a minor, minority staff director of the Subcommittee on the Separation of Powers of the United States Senate Judiciary Committee. Mr. Applegate has worked for the last half century in Montana and the Northwest on a broad range of critical natural, natural resource issues. He was the administrator of the Portland Harbor Superbike cleanup site, a prior director of the West Coast Conservation Division of Trout Limited, and has served on many boards which address national, natural resource issues. In August of 2020, he authored the 1972 Montana State Constitution Declaration of Rights and, and the Opportunities of the Bumpy Road Ahead, which was published in the Public Land and Resource Law Review. He is a principal of Applegate. And you get to see him, I can't see him, but Professor Williams, Robert Williams, a distinguished professor of law um, from Rutgers University, Rutgers University School of Law, director of the Center for State Constitutional Studies. Professor Williams earned his BA from Lottie in 1967 at Florida State University, where he was elected Phi Beta Kappa and Phi Kappa Phi. He earned his JD with honors in 1969 at the University of Florida School of Law, where he was executive director of the Law Review and a member of the Order, Order of the Court. Professor Williams also earned his LLM in 1971 at New York University School of Law, where he was a Ford Foundation Urban Law Fellow. In addition, he has been a Chamber, Chamberlain Fellow at Columbia University Law School, where he earned another bars of Florida, New Jersey, and the United States Supreme Court. He has been the Legislative Advocacy Director and Executive Director of Florida Legal Services, the International Legal Center Fellow in Kabul, Afghanistan, and a reporter of the Florida Law Division Council's Landlord Tenant Law Project. In addition, he served as a Legislative Assistant to Florida Senator T. Robert Graham, a staff attorney with Legal Services of Greater Miami, and a law firm Chief Judge T. Frank Hobson of the Florida, Florida Second District Court of Appeals. He has written several books, which include The Law of the American State Constitution, published in 2009, and the New Jersey State Constitution in 2012, and State Constitutional Law, Cases and Materials, published in 2006. He is the co-author of Legislative Law Articles. I'm sorry, he's co he is the co-author of legislative law and statutory interpretation, cases and materials. Among his articles are statutes as sources of law beyond their terms, in common law cases, published in George Washington Law Review, state constitutional law processes, William Mary Law Review, in the Supreme Court's shadow, the legitimacy of state rejection of Supreme Court reasoning and result, published in the South Carolina Law Review, equality guarantees in state constitutional law, Texas Law Review, the state constitutions of the founding decade, Pennsylvania's radical 1776 constitution and its influence on American constitutionalism, Temple Law Review. And finally, in the glare of the Supreme Court, continuing the methodology and legitimacy problems of independent state constitutional rights and adjudication, the better they law review. That took a little while. <laughs> So we're going to start with Mr. Crowder, and um, I'll just ask you, Mr. Crowder, I understand you have a particular interest in Article 2, Section 34 of the Montana Constitution, which provides for unenumerated rights, um, and also as, uh, its federal counterpart in the Ninth Amendment. Um, could you discuss some of that with us today and, and share your interest? Glad to. Uh... Thank you, Justice McKinnon, and thank you to the Montana Law Review uh, for putting this symposium on, all the work you put into this, and also for the invitation to speak. I'm honored to be a part of this. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about unenumerated rights. 
rights uh, as they relate to our Montana Constitution, uh, and then a bit about the, the federal counterpart with the Ninth Amendment, and uh, quickly also talk about a few other states uh, that have unenumerated right provisions in their constitutions as well. So I'd like to start by just reading the text of Montana's Constitution on Article 2, Section 34, that is the unenumerated rights provision. And this provides the enumeration in this Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny, impair, or disparage others retained by the people. This language virtually mirrors word for word the language in the federal Constitution. Now, if you're scratching your head a little bit about what are unenumerated rights, um, I've got good news in that you're not alone and you're in good company. Uh, late U.S. Supreme Court Justice uh, Robert Jackson um, actually made the comment in a lecture that the Ninth Amendment was a mystery to him as well. So, so uh, just share that there. Now, the text in both constitutions explicitly acknowledges that there are rights that we the people possess beyond what is specifically enumerated in the Constitution. So why have this provision in the Constitution? Because the founders, whether for the federal Constitution or our Montana Constitution, recognized that just because there are enumerated rights which you, the people possess, does not or it cannot be interpreted to mean that if, if a right is not enumerated, that you that 
this section would be a crucial part of any effort to revitalize the state government's approach to civil liberties questions. And that Section 34 may be the source of innovative judicial activity in the civil liberties field. These, these comments were made in the Bill of Rights Committee. It passed out of the Bill of Rights Committee unanimously. Uh, Delegate Dorothy Eck introduced that provision onto the House floor, and she said that these are rights which are, are self, where this provision is completely self-explanatory, um, recognizing there are rights which are not enumerated, which the people of Montana should not be denied. There was no discussion about that, and again, it passed unanimously. So, so there's really not a, a lot of uh, discussion we can draw off of from the Montana Constitutional Convention. So now if we turn to how the Montana Supreme Court has interpreted this provision, um, and thankfully we have uh, Montana Supreme Court uh, Justice, uh, former Justice James Nelson here with us, who, um, another Browning Symposium panelist who has done a lot of writing in some of his opinions on unenumerated rights, uh, namely in the cases of Snetzinger v. Montana University System and Dorwork v. Carraway. Um, he's got some concurrences there um, that if anyone wants to go in and read those, I, I won't go totally through those just in the, in the interest of time, um, but uh, we do have very limited actual case law development around this provision of our, our Constitution. Uh, we, we do have a case authored by, a uh, decision authored by Justice Nelson, uh, State v. Guile, uh, where it said, uh, it can be said that marriage and marital privacy are given heightened protection under our privacy provision and as one of the unenumerated rights retained by the people. So we, we see it cited there. Uh, in, the, in the Snetzinger decision, Justice Nelson wrote, the section could be used as the basis for the introduction of a theory of natural law or an expansion of the use of substantive due process or judicial finding of unstated individual rights hidden in the self-reliant, free-thinking, idiosyncratic Montana mythology. Presumptively, this could limit state police power and enlarge existing rights or create new rights. In uh, the case of Dorward v. Carraway, he also wrote in a concurrence, in my view, the real efficacy of this Article 2, Section 34 cause of action is to ensure that the enumerated fundamental rights are protected from diminution, limitation, and restriction. The standalone, standalone right of direct action for constitutional violations would protect the most basic and most important rights that Montanans enjoy. And, and I'm just not totally getting into the cases just because of, of time, but um, I, I, those are good cases to look at. Um, but what about other state constitutions? Because we don't have a lot of case law development here in Montana. So there are 33 states around the country that have a provision containing unenumerated rights. So I, I've gone through those 33 states to kind of look at how courts have interpreted those, um, have interpreted unenumerated rights under their constitutions. Um, I'm just going to talk about a few uh, cases and, and rights that were recognized. Uh, Alaska, um, a case out of 1974, the right of self-representation has been so retained by the people. Um, Arkansas, uh, they found a, a portion of an Arkansas statute criminalizing specific acts of private consensual sexual intimacy between persons of the same sex is unconstitutional as it infringes upon an individual's fundamental, fundamental right to privacy. That's 2002. Um, a couple of cases from Idaho. Fundamental right on, or the unenumerated right on education of children. Another one, uh, unenumerated right on personal appearance. The court said the right to wear one's hair in a manner of his choice is a protected right of personal taste not to be interfered with by the state unless the state can meet the burden of showing a substantial health, safety, academic, or disciplinary problem created by wearing a long hair. Um, there's some uh, cases in Mississippi on religious 
religious liberty in refusing blood transfusions. Uh, this was also a non-enumerated right. Uh, in Mississippi, an abortion case, an unenumerated right to an abortion, even though that case in 1998, uh, and that is pro-choice Miss B. Fordyce, also allowed for restrictions on this right. Uh, Utah, right to parental rights. Wyoming, right to travel. Um, ruled that a trial court which changed custody from a mother to a father due to a mother's relocation within the state beyond the limit contained in the divorce decree amounted to infringement on the mother's constitutional right to travel. So this is just, these are just a few cases um, of other states dealing with unenumerated rights. But now let's turn to the United States Supreme Court. A partial list of unenumerated rights might include those specifically recognized by the Supreme Court, such as the right to travel, the right to privacy, the right to economy, the right to dignity, the right to marriage, and until the recent Dobbs decision, the right to an abortion under the right to privacy. And two cases have emerged that one might call tests around unenumerated rights. Uh, well, no particular order, but Washington v. Glucksburg, which dealt with whether there was a right to assisted, physician-assisted suicide. Um, this case used language that we have regularly observed that the due process clause specifically protects those fundamental rights and liberties which are objectively, deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition. And if that language sounds familiar, it is also language that was in the recent Dobbs decision. Now contrast that uh, statement and reasoning with uh, another case, uh, Poe v. Ullman uh, from 1961, where in a dissent by Justice Harlan, he said that each new claim to constitutional protection must be considered against the background of constitutional purposes as they have been rationally perceived and historically developed. Though we exercise limited and sharply restrained judgment, yet there is no mechanical yardstick, no mechanical answer. The decision of an apparently novel claim must depend on grounds which follow closely on well-accepted principles and criteria. And, and a comment I'll just make on, on these two different approaches to unenumerated rights is that uh, with the Glucksburg reasoning, that deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition, I, I think, uh, while it may seem straightforward enough uh, as an approach to apply, thinking about what rights may have been commonly accepted or recognized in 1789 or not accepted in this country then versus the progress that has been made on rights that are commonly accepted in today's society would be limiting and, and backward focused, constraining us to the past, looking backwards. So in conclusion, I just have a few final thoughts here to wrap up um, and, and turn it over to our other panelists. Uh, I think one of the reasons you don't see unenumerated rights come up more in Montana is because our founders explicitly put the right to privacy into our Constitution. And a lot of these cases where there has been a recognized unenumerated right, whether at the federal level or in other states, um, have dealt with privacy issues. And so because we explicitly put that into our Constitution, I think maybe that's why we haven't, our courts haven't had to rely on unenumerated rights as much. Uh, and then, and only, only 10 other states other than Montana actually have a uh, constitutional right to privacy. Unenumerated rights are fragile. And what the justices on one court may recognize as an unenumerated right, justices on another court may not, or subsequent justices. Uh, just to wrap up, I thankfully, here in Montana, our Montana Constitution is a forward-looking document. And the framers made this clear in the transcripts of the convention. The Constitution was for this and future generations. And that 
from the Bill of Rights Committee, they recognize that this section would be important for the future. How can unenumerated rights come into play here in Montana going forward for the next 50 years? So our attorneys have to plead it. They have to make the arguments the best that they can. And if we don't plead it and bring it forward, we won't have a chance to develop the case law further um, on, on how our Montana Supreme Court and our courts recognize this provision. So that's what I have. I look forward to uh, questions and our other panelists. Thank you.
Sergeant Arms Paul B. Senator Hoy's son out uh, to get uh, haircuts. My, <laughs> my parents were thrilled. It wasn't, it wasn't long. Anyway, for today, I'll offer a few brief observations focused on how the delegates proceeded with the convention work, and of course how they approached the Declaration of Rights. And this still is frequently cited as, uh, I guess, the best of show, uh, viewed appropriately at the pinnacle of written Declarations of Rights. Uh, three basic points, I'll just weave through what I'm saying. Number one, on rights, I do think it's important to be explicit as you can, and you really take your chances. You don't know how it's going to come out, and I'll discuss a couple of examples of that. Second, it's important to follow up on the constitutional provisions. It's obvious they don't implement themselves, and they can't language. Third, for the 50 years ahead, I've written elsewhere, I think we're looking at a very bumpy road for uh, quite a list of reasons, uh, dealing some of them with our political culture and our dysfunction that is on display far too often, and not just here, but frankly, around the world. First then, in the work of the committee, uh, it was clear from the outset that the members were not of a mind to uh, ignore or in any way disparage the U.S. Constitution. Uh, in addition, they initially, at the insistence of Chairman DeHood, uh, agreed to the person that they would not displace or diminish any of the rights they found in the existing declarations. In short, they had come to understand both the documents sufficiently and the meaning, and they valued them both. At the same time, they sincerely believed in, and they even uh, almost reveled in, the notion that the states could and they should function to good effect as what were commonly termed in those days little laboratories. The National Unionist League and others had been making that point for some time. And a number of speakers here today from the beginning and have written lectures, litigated, and adjudicated deeply into that and related concepts. It's valuable to hear their observation. And they reflect on, of course, the value of state constitutions, which are and have been central to the U.S. legal system since well before the federal constitution was in place. In the case of committee members and many of the delegates generally, they were eager to focus directly on the advancement and the testing of new state constitutional provisions, particularly addressing new rights. It was a frequent topic of conversation in and outside the committee. It was often raised whenever a new rights proposal came up, and there were many of those, as can be seen clearly in the work of the committee and the finished product. As I noticed previously, from the beginning, of our work, we were actually focused on four different kinds of rights and political freedoms. The obvious protection of citizens against government intrusion, the protection of minorities against abusive majorities, and increasingly the protection of citizens uh, from abuses by the private sector. And fourth, establishing the foundations of the requisites for uh, political freedoms. Well, I feel strongly about many of the provisions, dignity, anti-discrimination, and more. I had a good bit of uh, to say about those uh, last night and give a time experience. Let's turn just to a few things. First, one key political freedom. Here's an explicit provision with an uncertain future. And freedom in this context is not about being left alone or uh, taking an 85 on a freeway on the way to uh, something apparently important, someone taking license to bear down angrily on your rear end uh, and uh, interrupting your otherwise relaxed alley. Uh, if you're driving in Texas or Arizona, <laughs> you need to do it. Political freedom is a far more important, serious, more difficult, and precious matter. It is all about the ability in a decent public arena for citizens to choose to speak fairly, openly, freely, to act within the bounds 
to judge the adequacy of rights as implemented by the legislature or agencies. I hope so, but I'm not really in a position to assess all that, having not examined those. We should all watch this one with interest because I think it is fundamentally important. The right of petition and patient in these cases is read and adjudicated as kind of an adjunct of the right to know. And my hope always was that the right of participation would lead to a healthy outpouring of experiments in the state and local government with a variety of participatory forums of various kinds where citizens could be recruited to help navigate some of the more difficult problems that plague and bedevil public officials. We all know there are plenty of those. There's not much of that going on here in the state, and that's unfortunate because this is a place where people know each other, where they get along. Don Foster on the committee reminded me that uh, late at night in rural areas, and I guess this is really true, they would move their pickups to an intersection, turn on the lights and music, and uh, dance along with a keg beer. <laughs> but more important, during the daytime, they were very comfortable discussing substantial issues with each other in deliberative formats, and not just in their market shops. Political freedom, of course, has vital prerequisites in freedom of speech, press, assembly, association, and in religious freedom. The kidney have felt that these uh, pillars of the First Amendment were pretty solid and concrete uh, in the First Amendment of federal law, and they spent very little time on that show. Uh, nor did the other delegates. An exception can be seen in this, just a little bit of a diversion that still tracks with this question of state and federal uh, interaction on these uh, constitutional issues. The exception can be seen in the Education Committee. And they fashioned a revision of provision prohibiting funding for uh, religious uh, schools. Recently, at the risk of oversimplifying, that was met with a thunderous uh, bolt of uh, lightning disapproval in one other of the dozens of sometimes controversial 5 to 4 U.S. Supreme Court decisions. It might be the end of the story, it seems, at least for now. I'm not intending to get into the substance or make an argument one way or another. But after this decision and a more recent dramatic reversal of Roe v. Wade, again, I'm not, I'm not talking about the substance of that. Some are actually left wondering, uh, some have taken to speculate on whether other rights might soon be at the center of the court's agenda going forward. In particular, they point to the logic that may envelop matters treated federally in the Griswold decision, where the right of privacy was enunciated out of the shadow penumbra, can you imagine we got into astronomy in the court case, the penumbra of the uh, Bill of Rights, a federal bill. And of course that was because it didn't contain an explicit right of privacy. A decision there could dramatically affect the interplay of federal and state jurisprudence and constitutional law. The lesson I take away from this, for today's purposes, is not about the details of the cases, but to emphasize how critical it may be for states to be specific and explicit about the important matters of constitutional law, put them to print, even knowing that they may not always ultimately prevail on them in their view or be consistent with what they intend. It may be that this is the importance of Montana's clearly stated right of individual privacy. It turns out the specificity was not sufficient in the case of the separation of church and state, construed one way by an 
so much for having me. And I'm so sorry I can't be there uh, in person. I I wanted to meet a lot of you and uh, reconnect with those with those that I already know. Uh, but I I commend the law review for taking the chance to celebrate this uh, anniversary. Uh, an anniversary is a terrible thing to waste. And it's particularly true given what Justice Nelson said last night, that state constitutions are really quite low visibility constitutions in our country. And you know, what this, it, it, it really is a sort of the American constitutional paradox that Many more people in our country, including lawyers and some judges, the media, citizens, they know more about the United States Constitution than they know about their own state constitution. And the reason it's a paradox, I think, is because virtually none of us can have any influence at all over the federal constitution. A few uh, may here and there, but it's very remote from us as, as lawyers and citizens. By contrast, the state constitutions are pretty accessible. Um, I just want to set my timer here. Uh, much closer to the people, uh, but yet people don't know about them. So it's very important, I think, on every possible occasion to bring, uh, to shine a spotlight on the state constitution uh, and to let people know uh, that these are, these are real constitutions. They have the same name as the United States Constitution, a constitution, but they're really quite different in many ways. And so I want to just take a few minutes to uh, make some observations about where the Montana situation fits in the national picture of state constitutional law uh, and the history of, of state constitutional law. Um, and I know some of you know these things, but some of you may not. Just the very idea that you can revise a constitution the way Montana did in 1972 is essentially unknown at the federal level. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's almost impossible to even amend the federal constitution, let alone revise it. There is a mechanism for it, but it's, it's virtually impossible to see, although there is a movement now uh, afoot. But the state constitutions are designed really quite differently from the beginning to be, um, as, as you may hear Emily Zakin say later, uh, as Miriam alluded to uh, earlier, the state constitutions are not designed to be this entrenched, permanent kind of document that governs to some extent from the grave. Rather, they've been designed to be uh, unentrenched uh, and, and malleable and, uh, and changeable by, by the, uh, the various generations. And uh, the states have a number of different mechanisms of change. And uh, you've heard uh, about the, the Montana uh, provisions, including now, since 1972, I guess the automatic uh, referendum every 20 years to to seek the opinion of the people on whether they want a convention to take a look at their uh, state constitution. Uh, it's actually Thomas Jefferson's idea. He thought uh, each living generation should have a chance to make its own uh, constitution, and now there's. I don't know, 16 or 18 states that use that mechanism. And of course, as we've seen in Montana, the, the citizens, citizens can say, no, we don't want that. Um, so it's important to remember that these state constitutions were intended to be updated through various mechanisms, uh, some of which were invented more recently, such as the initiative during the progressive era. era. Um, and these state constitutions are qualitatively different, even though, as I said, they have the same name, uh, 
also perform very different uh, political and legal functions. The most, the most extreme difference is the state constitution do not enumerate power for the state and government uh, the way the U.S. Constitution does. Uh, enumerates the uh, federal power to regulate interstate commerce and provide for post offices and post roads and all that stuff. Uh, everything else was left to the states, of course, and to the people. Uh, so you don't need to look in a state constitution to see where uh, the state legislature gets the power to pass a landlord tenant act or a corporate statute or a criminal statute or any of that. Rather, what you look at primarily, this is a little oversimplified, but rather what you look at primarily is, is there a limit in the state constitution? Is there a reason that the state legislature cannot do certain things? Or is there a reason the governor cannot do certain things? Well, that even the courts. So there are, uh, and there are a number of other differences. As you know, their state constitutions are much longer. They're much more malleable, as I just said. And so they're really quite a different constitutional animal in, in our uh, constitutional federal system. Um, and Montana's example in 1972 illustrates a number of the national lessons we know about state constitutional uh, change. Uh, again, which is almost virtually impossible at the federal level. Um, uh, last night, uh, May Nan mentioned the importance of the preparatory work done by the commissions to get the Constitutional Convention ready to operate. All of that research and preparatory material uh, the wise decision to put the most controversial uh, proposed changes on the ballot separately so they wouldn't sink the whole enterprise. Uh, again, very interesting in Montana, a very close vote and litigation was the adoption of the Constitution, the new Constitution valid. That was a judicial decision, three to two, very close. As I think Rick said last night, or maybe today, it was adopted by one vote. Um, you don't see that at the federal level. And so we've seen across the country the deep involvement of the state judiciary in the mechanisms of state constitutional change. It's very heavy litigation, as people would remember from back in 1972, I think. So um, the other Another uh, sort of national perspective on Montana's experience in 1972 was that there's a, a timeline that sort of dictates what kinds of issues will come before state constitutional conventions uh, during the time they meet. Um, and this, of course, was in the in Montana in the 1970s. And as we heard last night, this was a product pretty directly of the U.S. Supreme Court's one person, one vote decisions. And it wasn't, it didn't just affect Montana. During this period, it's about 12 or 13 years uh, from the mid-60s mid when those one person, one vote decisions came about until about 1976. More than a dozen states uh, revised their constitutions after their legislatures were reapportioned. I'm a product of that. I'm from Florida, and we revised re uh, our uh, Reconstruction era state constitution in 1967. It took effect in 1968, so I had a similar experience that Rick had as a kid. 21 years old out of undergraduate school, I got to work on the new state constitution. The people adopted it, and it was really a product of a reaction to the malapportioned, uh, rural-dominated state legislature. And that was true across the country. Um, the, so 
populations of the lower regions. Why is that? The Montana Constitution is a little bit unusual, not, not completely. Uh, in the net, it gives the Board of Regents control over most things for the state university system other than budget. Of course, that may come back to haunt the Board of Regents. Final thing, I don't want to go over my time, it is um, I think we're going to have to see with the polarization we've been talking about. Um, political parties have discovered state constitutions. So we're already, we have been seeing and will continue to see this, this pull between, let's say, uh, no abortion or right to choose. And people voting on those things. At the state level, uh, and these matters coming in front of state Supreme Courts in a way they never used to. This stuff always used to go to federal courts. Certainly when I came out of law school, uh, we tried, I was a legal services lawyer, we were trying to get our addiction cases in the federal court. So there's a lot to learn here about state constitutions for the students and for some of the lawyers uh, and even some of the judges. Uh, but I want to make sure to stop here just as my time is going on. So thank you very much. I hope I'll be able to hear the discussion. I'll give it my best shot. So I think we have a little bit of time for some questions from the audience. Any questions? I think we have time for one or two, if there are any questions. Or comments. Thank you. 
expression in statutes. Progressives call voter progressives voter suppression statutes. Violated some of the state constitutional lawmaking requirements. Was there more than one subject in the bill? Did the title describe it properly? Blah, blah, blah. Did it go to committee? These things, the defensive uh, skills that are going to be required in the future deserve some serious uh, study and, and, and analysis. Just thank you. Just just one quick comment with respect to both how defensively we need to be and how knowledgeable we need to be with respect to constitutional amendments. I can think of two. One, we're a very well financed special interest group, the Montana Association of Realtors, got a constitutional amendment that it's clearly legislative, but prohibits a realty transfer tax. But the one that's really even more egregious is the amendment that was passed, I think, with very little knowledge and understanding by the majority of the voters. And we now have a provision in Article 13 that takes away basic provisions that are in the Bill of Rights that says only a marriage between one man and one woman shall be valid or recognizes marriage in the state. So many people in our state do not realize we have prohibited as a matter of state law same-sex marriage. People are shocked when they realize that that is in our Constitution. I think we're at about time.